Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday night webinar. I'm Dr. Rita McGuire, the Chief Medical Officer here at Wakana, one of the co-founders. We wanna welcome all of our guests, all of our healthcare professionals. Happy, happy Doctor's Day to all of you that are on the line that has really been, you know, in the forefront, on the front line, during this pandemic, I know for me, it has been long, long hours. Uh, it's not over yet, but we do see a light at the end of the tunnel. We want to welcome all of our guests, all of our business partners, and we're going to get started. Um, this is a platform uh, for healthcare professionals. We feel that it's imperative that healthcare professionals understand uh, how CBD works. In fact, what is CBD? So a little bit about myself. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. Yes, of over 30 years. I attended Wayne State School of Medicine in Detroit, Michigan. I completed my residency at Cook County here in Chicago. It's now called Stroger Hospital. I'm the CEO of RJM Wellness and Rip Dorita Fitness. I'm a global speaker for women's health and fitness. I'm also a certifying physician for the medical marijuana program here in Illinois. I'm also one of the very first physicians that certified a patient for the opioid exchange program. We all know the opioid epidemic is on an all time high, especially during this COVID pandemic. I'm also a member of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation and Chief Medical Officer and one of the co-founders for Wakana for Life. So I want again to welcome all of you this evening. So, you know, we talk about why it's important for healthcare professionals to know about CBD. Why it's important is because our patients want to know. You know, our patients have heard a lot of information about CBD. They're coming to us for our opinion, our expertise, and it's important because it really is an uncharted territory. Um, so we need to understand how it works in the body, drug-drug interactions, uh, dosing, all of these things are important that our patients are looking for us to answer. So again, many of our patients, their medicine cabinets look like this, right? They're on multiple medications, there are medications for medications that cause side effects to a medication. In fact, the average 50-year-old patient is on about seven medications. The average 70-year-old is on about 10 medications. So many of our patients come to us asking, inquiring about CBD being an option for their health, being an option for their overall wellness, being an option for medications that possibly could be reduced or even eliminated. So why, as healthcare professionals, do we have a thumbs down when patients ask us about anything <laughs> herbal or natural or botanical or plant-based? Well, it's because we're not taught about herbal, botanical, natural healing, and traditional allopathic medicine or, or medical school. So again, medicine is evolving. You know, right now, it's not a good number, but less than five, six percent of medical schools are even teaching their students about cannabis, about the endocannabinoid system, about the science behind how this amazing plant works in the body. But more importantly, as healthcare professionals, we need to understand the difference between hemp and marijuana. See, cannabis is the family. And there are two species that the cannabis family has. One species is marijuana. See, that's the part of the, the, the species that gives you the high, that gives us our patients the paranoia, the euphoria, and even the munchies. See, the marijuana species has high levels of a compound called THC, or delta 9, hydro, delta 9 hydrocannabinol. It is the part of the plant that gives that person the high, the 
the euphoria, the paranoia. Now, the marijuana species has CBD in it as well, very small amounts of CBD, but it's important to understand there's another part of the plant called the hemp species that gives you the health without the high. You can say hemp is health, right? Hemp has high levels of CBD or cannabidiol. It is the compound we're gonna talk about exclusively tonight along with other botanicals, but it gives our patients the ability to use a natural, holistic, organic product without getting high. It contains very trace amounts of THC. In fact, by definition, hemp is defined as containing 0.3% or less of tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. So when we look at the plant, the plant has uh, cannabis sativa L, there's an indica, there's a ruderalis. In fact, the ruderalis is really part of the cannabis family that is not used very often. But when we talk about the indica species, that is more of the part of the plant that gives us um, in the couch, if you've heard, it gives you more sedation than the sativa. Sativa is uplifting. It gets you focused. It gets you energized. It also has so many other benefits that we're gonna talk about as well. So let's look at the anatomy for a brief moment. And the reason why the anatomy is important is because you will understand where different parts of the plant is utilized. So the stem is utilized more for textiles, for clothes. In fact, there are a lot of companies that are uh, making underwear, underwear from hemp. Uh, other clothing like blue jeans, uh, gym shoes, you name it, CBD is really mainstreaming that way. And then the seed, the seed is where we extract most of the oils, the tinctures. Um, the seeds are also in the buds are used for the smokable products like the pre-rolls and the premium flour. The seeds are also used for um, not only tinctures and smokables for edibles as well. So this is part of the plant that is mostly used for medicinal purposes. And then the leaves, the leaves, the large fan leaves are not used medicinally, but more the sugar leaves, the smaller leaves that you see here on the plant are used for production of tinctures and topicals and smokables. So when we look at CBD and we look at the number one top reason why healthcare providers just want to shun away from anything that is closely related to cannabis, it's really because they don't understand how CBD interacts with drugs that our patients are on. Because we know even though botanicals and, and natural products and herbs are good for the most part, they still have the potential to interact with our patient's medication. So it's an, very important to understand if CBD can inhibit or reduce the effects of medications that our patients are on and to antagonistically, or if they can potentiate, they can have an interaction that can cause the medication that your patient may be on, for instance, like a blood thinner like Coumadin to have an increased potential. We know that CBD along with a lot of other medications are metabolized through the liver. So we'll talk about in detail that um, pathway that CBD and many other drugs work in the liver to be metabolized. Another concern as physicians that our patients bring up is, you know, they want a product that won't show up on their drug screen. You know, many of our patients, even though many are still working virtually, there are a lot that are getting random drug screens. There are a lot of our patients that may be teachers or pilots or flight attendants or parole officers, different areas in the industry where they're still having random drug screens. So 
it's important to know that there are products that potentially could show up in their drug screens. And then there are other products where we call broad spectrum products that will not show up in your patient's drug screen. So it's important to align yourself as healthcare providers with companies that have integrity, with companies that are doing the proper and adequate testing on products to ensure that one, they're sourced from the hemp species, right? And not the marijuana species, because if CBD is sourced from the marijuana species, it will cause them to fail their drug screen. Also, the percentages, percentages of 0.3% or less, that is the definition of hemp. So those full spectrum products that contain the legal limit of THC, which is very, very small, could potentially cause your drug screen to be positive. Though those products that are less than 0.0% or less of THC, those broad spectrum products that so many of our patients are looking for, they absolutely will be able to pass their drug screen. So that's really important to know all of these important things as it relates to this plant. But Dr. Sanjay Gupta, our colleague, is someone who brought cannabis back mainstream. And he did that by presenting the science. You know, in 2013, he came back and said, we were systematically misled. He said, as a physician, I didn't dig deep enough. I didn't look into the data. I didn't look at other countries like Israel. Israel has more data on cannabis than any other country. Next country will be Spain. But definitely the U.S., we're behind in the data and we're behind on the data because marijuana, cannabis, has been illegal for so many years. But in 2018, our laws changed. Our laws changed in 2018 to allow hemp to be legally sold, cultivated, and consumed in all 50 states, as long as it is 0.3% or less of THC. So Dr. Sanjay Gupta did the research. He met families like the family of Charlotte Fiji, the little girl that had Dravet syndrome. He saw how this little girl was having over 300 seizures a week. And when her parents introduced her to CBD, she went from having 300 seizures to three. The list goes on and on and on of the interviews and the travels which showed him that over 5,000 years of digging, not one person, not one person has ever died or overdosed from cannabis. So it's a very safe, it's a very effective plant. It is a very effective botanical. It's a very effective herb to be used for healing. Now the FDA has approved only one CBD prescription. That's Epidolax. Epidolax is produced by GW Pharmaceuticals, and it is one of the only FDA-approved prescriptions that is a CB, CBD-based synthetic drug that's used for children who have Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, Dravet syndrome, and tuberous sclerosis complex. So if you're on the line and you're a healthcare professional, specifically a pediatric um, healthcare professional, you probably know about Epidolex. So let's back up again and let's talk about hemp. Again, hemp is one of the species that is from the cannabis family that gives our patients the opportunity to obtain their health without the high. It contains 0.3% or less of THC. It has large levels of CBD or cannabidiol. So when we look at cannabidiol or CBD, and we look at the other main players that the hemp plant and even the marijuana plant produces, but we're going to concentrate on the hemp plant tonight, you can see that CBD or cannabidiol has a long list of medicinal benefits. You know, it is an antibacterial. It inhibits cancer cell growth. There's studies that show it's neuroprotective in those patients who have had strokes or who have uh, movement disorders like Parkinson's or even dementia. 
it reduces seizures and convulsions that we talked about. Uh, it promotes bone growth. It reduces blood sugar levels. It reduces the function of the immune system. So in those patients that you may have that have autoimmune conditions like lupus and fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, studies have shown that CBD has helped with that. It reduces inflammation, really important because when we look at chronic illnesses that we treat in our practices every day, it's inflammation. That's the root cause of obesity and diabetes and heart disease and hypertension. It reduces the risk of arterial blockage. That's really important in those patients who have coronary artery disease. It reduces small intestinal contractions in our patients who have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. It reduces nausea and vomiting. Really big in cancer treatment patients. It relieves pain. It relieves anxiety. It helps to slow bacterial growth in those patients who have MRSA or methicillin resistant staph aureus infections. It suppresses muscle spasms, again, in those patients with multiple sclerosis or restless leg syndrome. It treats psoriasis, a lot of skin disorders, eczema, acne. Why? Because we know skin disorders are a combination of inflammation and bacterial infections. It's a basal relaxant. Helps to dilate those vessels to, that are really uh, important for blood flow to get to. Important organs like the testicles and erectile dysfunction. I mean, the, the penis and erectile dysfunction. In the heart, helping to improve hypertension or high blood pressure in our patients. But what's also important is the synergy. The synergy with the other compounds that this plant makes. This plant makes over 130 different cannabinoids that synergistically work on a cellular level to improve sleep, to improve um, anxiety, to improve those who have issues with losing weight. I mean, the list goes on and on. In fact, there's 20,000 peer review articles that talk about the benefits of CBD. So your next question is, Dr. Rita, how does it work? Why? Because that was my first question. Four years ago when the CEO of Wakana, Melissa Boston, told me about CBD, I'd never heard of CBD. I didn't even know what it stood for, right? Uh, CBD, cannabidiol, well, how does it work? Well, there's a science behind how it works in the body. And the science is called the human endocannabinoid system. And what's so great about this science is that we all possess an endocannabinoid system. Like we all have an endocrine system, a musculoskeletal system, a nervous system. Well, the endocannabinoid system is a system that puts our body back in balance or homeostasis. This system specifically does that through receptors that are found throughout our entire body. So when our patients consume CBD, these receptors are then bound and then signals are transmitted to different organs, different glands, the central nervous system, the, the, the brain, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the skin. You can see in this diagram, every organ and gland in our body has receptors that are looking for cannabis-like cannabinoids that we talked about to put it back in balance to regulate and modulate our appetite, our immune system, our motor activity, our coordination, our pain perception, our short and long-term memory, our thinking, our mood, our sleep. So we also have compounds that our body makes, you know, endocannabinoids or endogenous cannabinoids. Our body produces cannabinoids just like the plant does. And they're called anandamide and 2-AG. Now, these are the two main players that are responsible to keep our patient's body in homeostasis. But what happens, these two endocannabinoids become deficient. Why? Because our patients many times are eating poorly. They're eating McDonald's and Wendy's and Chick-fil-A and, and Portillo's. They're eating processed food. Uh, they're under a lot of stress. They're not sleeping well. All of these factors make our endocannabinoid system deficient. 
And so these endogenous cannabinoids are not produced. And then we have illness. We have an over, overhaul of inflammation in the body. We can't sleep because our neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin can't be released because we're out of balance. So there's different ways that our patients can consume CBD. There's capsules, there's edibles, there's a tincture, oral applicators, there's liquids, water solubles. Our patients can add CBD in their water, their juice. There's vape pens, there's cartridges, there are pre-rolls, there's flour, and then there's topicals. And the way that the transmission is sent is very, very unique. In the endocannabinoid system, it's a retrograde transmission. You know, in, in our neural uh, units, in medical school, pharmacy school, dental school, we learned that the transmission in the ner central nervous system is from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic neuron. But in the endocannabinoid system, it's reversed. And it's reversed retrograde where when we consume CBD, it binds to receptors in the postsynaptic neuron. It sends a signal or transmits to the presynaptic neuron. And because of that, we see profound results in those who have seizure disorders or hyperactivity disorders like ADHD and inflammatory disorders like arthritis and gout and autoimmune disorders. This retrograde transmission causes the body to come down, to be in homeostasis and in balance. So this is how the transmission in the endocannabinoid system works. So again, these receptors, the main ones are CB1 and CB2 receptors. They're found in the brain, the central nervous system, the spleen, the bones, the skin, the pancreas, the, the intestinal tract, the reproductive organs, the uterus, the ovaries, the testicles. Every single organ and gland in our body has receptors that are looking for cannabinoids. This is another diagram where you see when one consumes cannabinoids, they bind to those receptors and send a signal retrograde. Now, the studies, you can do your due diligence. PubMed is a great way to start your article uh, research on CBD and different um, situations, different challenges our patients may have. You'll find lots of research and data on CBD and GI disorders like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Um, you'll see uh, a lot of studies on CBD assisting with those who are undergoing cancer treatment for nausea and vomiting, um, those who are um, dealing with anxiety disorders, how CBD also can help to assist with those disorders. And it's all based on science, the endocannabinoid system. Those pathways, those dopamine and serotonin pathways are then able to release uh, more of those neurotransmitters to provide our patients with less anxiety and depression. CBD used in difficult to treat pain, uh, our patients with sciatica, neuropathy, uh, the list goes on and on and on. So I'm going to hand it over now to my colleague, Dr. Joy Smith, who is a PharmD. Um, she is the lead pharmacist at Strozier Hospital. She is a, a wife, a mom, and truly an advocate for uh, CBD, for the cannabis plant, for essential oils, for botanicals, for natural healing for our patients. So I am going to give it back over to you now, Dr. Joy Smith. Are you out there? I sure am, Dr. Rita. Thank you so much for that introduction and hello everyone. Um, as Dr. Rita stated, I am Dr. Joy Smith. I work at Stroger Hospital, also known as Cook County, where she did her residency. So we are connected in that way as well. I'm trying to get on here to the slideshow so we can start from the top. All right. So as she stated, I'm Dr. Joy Smith. Um, I graduated from Florida A&M University. So if I have any rattlers out there, Hello, hello, hello. Um, I'm a licensed pharmacist. I've been a pharmacist for about eight years um, in various settings. I started in retail, went to outpatient, did a little inpatient, 
Um, I've been in the ambulatory clinic and just moved all around, right? And so in addition to pharmacy, I knew that I wanted to explore the holistic side of healing, the holistic side of, of being able to address the total person and not just symptoms or not just disease. So I became an integrative nutrition health coach. I'm also a certified aromatherapist, as Dr. Rita talked about, with my love for essential oils. Um, and when Wakana found me, in addition to all the great information, all the great knowledge that Dr. Rita provides us with regard to CBD, I wanted to uh, join a society of pharmacists that are also interested in advancing the cannabis space. So the International Society of Cannabis Pharmacists is one of my homes. And I'm also a Ruby dispensary owner at Wakana. So just so excited to talk with you all this evening, especially our healthcare professionals on the line. You know, I love our distributors. I love my business partners, but I want to speak to our healthcare professionals so they can begin to advance this cannabis space as well. So some of the most popular reasons that people use CBD, Dr. Rita touched on a lot of them, and this graph kind of reiterates what she was talking about, but the ones that I'm going to focus on from this graph are anxiety, depression, and pain. So you see the most popular reasons in, in order of percentage, and then we're going to go to the literature. Dr. Rita already stated, and I agree, that us as healthcare professionals, we want to know the science. We want to see the literature, see the facts. And so when we're talking about chronic pain, that's the number one cause of dis disability and disease burden globally. So, I mean, it's just really racking our nation and racking our communities. Anxiety, you got 18.1% of the population every year dealing with a mental illness or anxiety, which is one of the co most common mental illnesses. And then we have about 6.7% of American adults that's had a depressive episode in a given year. I mean, with this last year with COVID, there's even information from the Journal, Journal of American Medical Association talking about the prevalence of depression symptoms. And this really applies in the area that I work in because I work with these patients that are described. It says prevalence of the depression symptoms in the US were more than threefold higher during this COVID-19 pandemic compared to before the pandemic. And who is it affecting? People with lower social resources, lower economic resources, ones that are exposed to greater stressors like job loss, right? So I'm dealing with people with lower social resources all the time because at the county hospital, we treat people regardless of ability to pay. So they may not have the economic resources. They may not have the health literacy. And they're dealing with all of that on top of the pandemic. So there's just a lot of, a lot of mental disability going around. There's a lot of physical disability go around with regard to pain, with regard to anxiety, with regard to depression. And a lot of people are turning to what we call botanicals or those plant-based options that have medicinal benefit. And so people are kind of moving, um, not necessarily moving all the way away from prescription medications, but seeking other alternatives because they're not liking the side effects. They're not liking the way that they feel when they take them. So one of the questions may be as people are seeking out uh, holistic options as people are seeking out botanicals. How do you help your patients and do your patients have to worry about drug drug interactions between CBD and prescription medications because CBD is going to be one of those things that's going to address all of those things on that chart that we saw. That graph talked about anxiety, it talked about depression, it talked about pain. CBD can help to address those symptoms or help to ease those symptoms. And is that CBD going to interact with the prescription medications that these patients are taking? So the short answer, yes, they can. Now, why shouldn't this make you run away from CBD? And why shouldn't this make you further educate yourself about CBD? Because all of the medications that, about 90% of the medications really, that we're prescribing to our patients or that for me personally that I'm counseling my patients on are metabolized by these six CYP450 enzymes, right? So if you remember from, from school, long while ago, however long you've been practicing, these are some of the main enzymes that are gonna metabolize those drugs that patients are taking. Uh-oh, excuse me. All right, so CBD is a substrate of 2C19 and 3A4. That's what's responsible for breaking our CBD down. Now, CBD can also inhibit anything that travels down the pathway of 2C9, 2D6, and 3A4. So that's why I'm saying, yes, CBD and your different medications that you're prescribing your patients can interact. But why shouldn't we run away? Because we prescribe, we prescribe medications and counsel patients on medications that interact all the time. And what do we do? We space those medications out two to four hours from the time that uh, one is taken from the other. 
So in this case, if there's a medication that interacts with CBD or vice versa, you just make sure that your patient takes their CBD about two to four hours before they're taking their prescription medication. And that is going to ensure that those medications are not traveling down the same metabolic pathway at the same time. Now, I have a couple, of, well, not a couple, I have a lot of medications that I see often because these are the types of conditions that I'm dealing with in the outpatient pharmacy. We're dealing with high cholesterol, we're dealing with hypertension, heart complications. If any of you all are general practice physicians, I'm sure that you all are seeing this all the time, nurse practitioners, those of us that are dealing with a multitude of issues with our patients. And so all of these medications have the potential to interact with CBD. But again, what do we do? We space the medications out. We make sure that they're not traveling down the metabolic pathway at the same time. Therefore, the patient can enjoy the benefits of CBD and they can also uh, get the therapeutic benefit of the medications that they're taking. So you may say, why should I care about this? Who's using alternative medicine? Why do I need to even know about this and educate myself as well as my patients? And these treatment trends will kind of give you an idea of what people are gravitating towards now. So I'm specifically focused on botanicals because that's what our CBD is gonna fall under. And that is what the essential oils that I'm gonna talk about in a moment are gonna fall under. So you can see from 2014 to 2025, we're making this gradual steady increase in terms of the people that are spending money on uh, botanicals and alternative treatments and how it's increasing to 2025. So people are really getting on the bandwagon and understanding not only about botanicals, but acupuncture, mind and body treatments, yoga, different things that are helping patients from a holistic perspective as opposed to always moving to prescription drugs. Now, am I recommending that you just snatch all of your patients' prescription drugs from them? No. I know that a lot of medications have to be slowly tapered off. They can't just be stopped abruptly because that's going to cause a larger problem for your patients. But I would encourage you to open your mind to the holistic options for treatment, the holistic options for healing. And even if they're not for treatment or for cure, they can help with some of the symptomatic issues that patients are having. So now we're moving to essential oils. I, I mentioned that I was a certified aromatherapist at the beginning of this call. And if you are not familiar with essential oils, I know people have been hearing about them, but they are tried and true ways of um, bringing our bodies back into a state of wellness, right? So essential oils listed here are the volatile aromatic liquids that come from plants and can, can come from the leaves, the flowers, the roots, the resin a lot of areas of the plant that can be extracted in order to provide a benefit for patients. So they're very potent. Less is better, actually. More is not better. One drop of oil can cover each cell in the body about 40,000 times. And I mean, it just, it's just amazing how much a small amount of these essential oils can really impact the body from a wellness perspective. Um, they're fat soluble. So if you know anything about the blood brain barrier, that is a fat uh, a fat layer that the, the essential oils can go through. There are some drugs that are fat soluble versus water soluble. So it makes it easy to penetrate even through the skin when you're applying it topically. It makes it easier to penetrate through the skin. And as you'll see in a couple of slides from now, essential oils have different chemical constituents and it makes their uses limitless and it makes their uses um, very versatile in terms of how you can use essential oils from pain relief to relieving anxiety to um, uplifting the mood. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I tell this story and I'm going to condense it for you, but this is just a testament to how long essential oils have been around. And it's probably even before this story, but during the bubonic plague of 1413, there were um, doctors who were caring for the patients who were dying of the bubonic plague. And so they wouldn't get sick and infected, they wore these robes. They wore these masks that looked like beaks. And on these robes and inside these masks, there was an essential oil blend of um, lemon, clove, rosemary, eucalyptus, and cinnamon. And that is a blend that doesn't really allow uh, viruses to live for a long time, right? So, um, and that, that blend was created by spice merchants. These spice merchants said, I wanted to create something that was going to help me when I'm going to steal, unfortunately, going to steal out of the graves of these people who um, have died from the bubonic plague. They weren't doing it for the right reason, but when they created these, these uh, blends, it allowed them not to uh, contract any of the bubonic plague that was killing everyone. So they applied this, this on their temples, they applied this on their feet, 
um, around their nostrils, any place that they could to make sure that they were not uh, inhaling or absorbing that bubonic plague that was the airborne microbes that were coming as a result of the bubonic plague. So the doctors took that on too. They doused their robes in it. They doused their mask in it just to make sure that they were protecting themselves. And that's just a testament to how long essential oils have been around. So when we're specifically talking about essential oils and what happens when you inhale them, the essential oils go through the nasal cavity and they go through the olfactory neurons and they impact an area of the brain that we know as the amygdala, which is the emotional center. So that uh, speaks to why you may smell a dinner or you, why you may smell a perfume or a cologne that your significant other used to wear or that your mom or dad used to wear and it'll just bring back memories for you. And that's what happens when we smell aromatic substances or essential oils or anything that has a scent to it, right? When you're applying to the skin, uh, and a massage therapist may use some eucalyptus or peppermint to really get into those muscles and really relieve the tension of those muscles. If there's a personal care uh, company, they may add lavender to a bath bomb or to a bath salt to really relax the body, to really soothe the body. So there are just so many ways that essential oils can be used and we are still learning, especially through the research about how it can be used in different scenarios. So the Asian Pacific Journal of Tropical Biomedicine um, wrote about essential oils and talks about how once they get into the system, they actually go to the site of malfunction. They know where to go. They know what to do. And after various per permutations, you can get relief from different ailments, right? Like depression, uplifting that mood, indigestion, headache, relieving that pain, insomnia, really helping you to get rest, muscular pain. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But what's important to know is that essential oils are more beneficial when you're considering other aspects of life. You want to make sure your diet is good. You want to make sure that your uh, the lifestyle is is one that is promoting wellness and promoting health. Essential oils can't just just like CBD as well can't just come in and save the day when you're not taking care of your body from the beginning. So yes, these these uh, botanicals do work. Yes, these botanicals do have benefit but not when the body is under so much stress that it can't even accept it. So let's make sure that our diets are, are great. No fried foods. Let's make sure that our lifestyles are ones that where we can reduce stress as much as possible. You know, these are things that we're considering when we're considering adding another holistic option on top. Now, these two charts are important because they're talking about the chemical constituents of essential oils. Remember I said before that they're so versatile that they can be virtually limitless in terms of the ways that they work inside of our body or inside of our olfactory neurons or what have you. So if we're talking about, let's for say for instance, the aldehydes, the aldehydes have the properties of being sedatives, anti-inflammatories, antivirals, right? So if we go to the corresponding side of the chart on the right, that might be Melissa essential oil or citronella or eucalyptus or lemongrass. And then you can see that all of these correspond with the different areas on each side of the chart. And so our possibilities for essential oils are really limitless, as it stated in the previous slide. Um, we have a lot of uses for essential oils that we are still learning in the research, even down to using them in your home for uh, cleaning solutions, for um, helping to address airborne microbes that you may have to diffuse it's flu season or diffuse when it's cold season. So it's just really awesome to be able to have an alternative to some of the, the harmful medications that we take, something that can help with symptomatic relief on top of the things that we take and the things that we prescribe to our patients. So I always want to talk about safety towards the end. Um, don't apply to open wounds. These are things that you can share with your patients to make sure that they understand that when they're using essential oils, there are certain protocols that should be followed. And of course, if there are any questions, I will make sure that I put my information in the chat, but these are just a couple that I wanna leave with you. Um, don't apply to open wounds. It could irritate that open wound. Make sure you're applying around it, especially if you're using for pain or irritation, or just wait till that wound kind of scabs up and heals. And then you can begin to apply essential oils either with the carrier oil or neat. Um, keeping away from the eyes and washing hands. Normally when we get something in our eyes, what do we do? We run straight to the cold water. But what we know is oil and water doesn't mix, so we don't want to do that. We want to grab a carrier oil like a coconut, an almond, a grapeseed, whatever you have handy, even if it's olive oil, um, and put that on the eye as opposed to the, the water because that oil is going to bond with that other oil and pull it right out. 
patch testing a small area. We know when we're prescribing uh, medications to our patients, especially if they're topicals, that we have them to patch test a small area to make sure that there are no sensitivities and make sure it's an inconspicuous area like the back of the arm, the back of the leg, something that won't be seen in case there is a reaction. And you know, your, if your patient is under uh, your care for a pregnancy or a serious medical condition or on multiple medications, just like we talk about CBD and talking about the interactions and spacing them out, there are some essential oils that have some of the same actions as our medications. So we want to make sure that we're spacing them out, whether we're using them topically or if there's some oils that can be used internally that we're spacing them out in that way. If there are any questions, again, you can feel free to reach out to me and we can do some of those drug interaction checks. Um, we talked about the spacing between medications and essential oils or um, spacing between medications and CBD. We don't want to shy away from these botanicals just because we don't know how they operate. We want to educate ourselves and not be willfully ignorant to them so that we can know another way to help our patients that provides them with symptomatic relief. We talked about the fact that more is not better. These are very volatile compounds. They, they cross the blood-brain barrier. They are, um, they are amazing at doing a lot with just a little, okay? So a little bit goes a long way. And as far as diffusing, there are some uh, hospitals and some cancer wards that are using a, uh, essential oils in the diffuser, whether it's for calming with the lavender or maybe peppermint to relieve some nausea and vomiting. And those are just some examples. Um, but essential oils are being used and diffused in areas where patients need the most assistance. And so if you are diffusing, it would be smart to have a diffuser that either cuts off or uh, diffuses intermittently, or if the patient can get up and walk away after a 30 minute time frame if they're sitting around, just to make sure that the, the senses are not overwhelmed. So those are just a few of the safety considerations that I wanted to share with you all. As always, I will put my information in the chat if you have any questions, if there are drug interaction questions with CBD or essential oils that you'd like to speak about. Um, always open, always excited to help. So Dr. Rita, I will give it back to you. Fantastic. As always, Dr. Joy, I want to um, open it up for any questions. If we have healthcare professionals on the line that want to ask questions, there is a question there, right? Let's see. From Sandra Pina, what product would you suggest for people who have insomnia and the gummies didn't work for them. They don't want to take a uh, product with THC. So first I would recommend our pure gummies and our pure tinctures since they can't have uh, products with THC. Our Delta-8 is a product that is a cousin of THC, so you don't want to recommend that. I would find out first what they were taking specifically and how much they were taking specifically and how long they were taking specifically. So you're gonna need those three very important questions answered because what I find is that a lot of people think that they can take CBD one time, two times, maybe three times, and it's going to work. It is not like that for everyone. CBD works differently in everyone, why? Because we have a different body chemistry, we're of different weight, uh, we have different levels of insomnia. So those specific questions, Sandra, you can um, absolutely email myself or Dr. Joy Smith the answers and we will help you with recommending what to do next. What would be a recommending starting dose for a diagnosed schizophrenic who has no depression, no anxiety, just finds it a struggle to think for ourselves at times and how long before we begin to see improvement. So again, we uh, don't know when you'll be able to see improvements because everybody is different. Their body chemistry is different. Uh, their, their weight is different. When we talk about CBD and really introducing it to the body, start low and slow. So three drops of the Hempranium 500 or three drops of the Hemp MD, if they're able to use the full spectrum product with the 0.3% or less of THC. If not, if that person has random drug screens, then the Pure, our broad spectrum product, three drops in the morning and three drops in the evening. That is a great way to start CBD products. 
if after a week or four or five days, you want to increase the dose, you can to eight drops twice a day. The maximum dose is 15 drops twice a day. I would also recommend the one gummy at night, the power gummy or the pure gummy, one gummy at night. Just know that there is a range to increase our products. Let your patients know, let your, your family know, uh, whoever you're recommending a CBD to, let them know it is not magical and that using it for a week, they may not or they may see results. So that's really important to understand that along with CBD, lifestyle modifications, you know, limit alcohol use, limit smoking, uh, improve your diet, increase your water, all of these lifestyle modifications, uh, getting more active are going to help to bring a better result when using CBD. Did you want to add anything, Dr. Joy? You got it all. And I think you led us into um, the next question from Claudia about any of our products helping with energy. Um, I think it speaks to what we said in the essential oil slide about essential oils and CBD for that matter, being able to have a bigger impact once lifestyle, lifestyle is given consideration. So as far as the energy, increasing the, the water, increasing the exercise, two of our products that I'm thinking about that come to mind specifically, and I'm going to go on the essential oil side this time, is peppermint, um, lemon, actually three, peppermint, lemon, and eucalyptus. And I say those because those are very invigorating um, scents, specifically the peppermint and eucalyptus. I know Dr. Rita does the same, but I'll take the peppermint, either the spray and the, or the oil and rub it on my hands and inhale. Sometimes I drop it in my mask before uh, I start work because our masks at work sometimes smell like mothballs. So it helps with the smell as well as uh, the energy. And then the lemon essential oils or any other citrus essential oils are really going to be uplifting and energizing as well. So from the essential oil perspective, those energy boosting oils are ones that I would recommend. Yeah, I use the peppermint on the soles of my feet. So mm -hmm. when I wake up in the morning, I do that before my workout. I also put it in my hands as a diffuser, uh, gives me great energy. But when you use peppermint on the soles of your feet, that will cause that uh, essential oil to go through the largest pores of our body, which are found on the soles of our feet. You can have that energy all the way midday most of the times I have it all day long. So peppermint, I love. Now the lemon, I love using in my kitchen, you know, as I'm cleaning countertops and dishwater, a very, again, evig very invigorating, can't say the word tonight. Um, and also now that I think about it, I may start using lemon on the soles of my feet as well for energy. So just so many natural holistic ways of getting energized, not drinking Red Bulls and, and Pop and Pepsi and Coke, such a great alternative for energy as well. What do we have? Mom takes her meds at six, nine, five, and nine. Where do I squeeze her CBD oil best for the two to four hours prior? Looks like that between that nine to five is gonna be the best. Um, you could go about noon, noon yep. or one o'clock, because that seems like that's right in the middle and it's gonna give you four hours, one o'clock will give you four hours on either side. That way you don't have to worry about cutting it too close. Um, and then mom's meds, if you wanna send me her meds, I took my, put my email in the chat. Uh, the next time I go back to work, I can do an interaction check because we'll be surprised. There are a lot of meds that interact with CBD, but some that actually don't. Like when there's a, a drug interaction check, it'll show drug food or drug uh, ethanol interactions. It won't show drug drug interactions between uh, cannabidiol and some of our medications. So it's always important to check. But if you don't know, I would suggest that space of two to four hours. So for you, it looks like that 1 p.m. time frame would be good for mom for yeah. tea sorry tea okay sounds great wonderful so we're going to share with you our next call can you see that slide 
Yes, I can. Wonderful. So we are hosting a business overview. So if you're on the line, you want to hear more information specifically about our products, our business and the opportunity, you want to tune in in about 10 minutes on our business overview. If you're a guest on the line, uh, the person who invited you will give you that passcode and we will see you in 10 minutes. If not, we'll see you next week. Again, thank you for all of our business partners for joining us. Thank you guests for joining us, healthcare professionals, We'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Joy. Thank you.